Hi, I'm Lisa Savage. Thanks for joining us. I'm your host at Pathways to Progress, and I'm here with Portland City Councilors Victoria Pelletier and Roberta Rodriguez to talk about the 13 referenda items on the upcoming ballot here in Portland. The first question is going to be uh, read in its entirety. It is the land acknowledgement that the Charter Commission proposed be added to the preamble of the city charter. It goes like this. Portland is located in the unceded territory of the Ecosisco Band of the Wabanaki, which also includes the Abenaki, Maliseet, Mi'kmaq, Passamaquoddy, and Penobscot people. European colonizers displaced Wabanaki people by force and went on to displace and harm indigenous peoples throughout what is now Maine and the United States. We acknowledge that displacement and that harm with sorrow, even as we celebrate and honor the Wabanaki knowledge and culture that continue to thrive in the tribal nations that called and always will call this place, the Dawnland, their home. Okay, um, so this is this is the big one, definitely. I think for a lot of people that are looking at the ballot, um, and I certainly had some trouble with this one. Not for the reason people may expect. I was actually fine with the strong mayor model. It was more the expansion of the council that actually gave me a little bit of pause, and I had to work through. Um, and I think the thing that helped me the most was taking myself out of the conversation and thinking of myself as a constituent, and also thinking about what Portland I want to see moving forward. And I certainly want to see a Portland that is accessible and accountable. Um, and I also want to see a Portland where we are voting individuals into these positions who can be policy makers and who can actually craft policy. I want the people making the policy to be the ones that I voted for. I think of the council right now as a council manager setup. So we are really subordinate to the city manager. And at times that makes it very challenging for us to really craft the policy that I think that we want to, especially when the, the policy is not status quo and maybe a little bit different than what's been done historically. So I am in, in support of question two um, because I, I'm thinking about the accessibility of the council. I'm thinking about the representation of the council. And again, I'm thinking who is crafting policy and those are the individuals that I want to know that I voted into office to do so. And I'm also thinking about, um, again, the, the part that was tough for me, which was the expansion of the council, but taking myself out of it, because my first thought was, there's nine of us already, and like, how are we gonna do anything with, with 12 people? But I'm thinking about smaller districts, I'm thinking about a better constituent to councilor ratio. I'm thinking about the fact that we are stretched very thin in the fact that we have committees that we're on, we have commissions and boards that we're serving on. If we have additional councilors, that's more room for collaboration, that's more hands on deck, and that's more accountability for us to the people that voted for us because we're not so stretched thin by managing these very large districts. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm in support of question two. I know that it's scary for a lot of people, but I think that's just in the nature of change. I think change is scary for individuals, but I wanna know that I am part of and have been part of um, a government system that really works for everybody and represents everybody. And also, I want the counselors that are going to come after me to be empowered enough to be able to craft policy without worrying about being overruled or undermined and just based on what the policy is. So um, yeah, I'm in, I'm in full support of, of question two, and I really encourage individuals to think about the Portland that they want in their future. Um, it's different. It's definitely going to be a change, but I'm really excited for that. And I do think that, again, this will make Portland government more representative to the people, knowing that the ones that we elected can, can craft policy and are empowered to do so. So I can't believe I made it. I kept waiting for the buzzer to go off. <laughs> With 10 seconds Woo! to spare. Outstanding. Nice job. <laughs> All right, you can take her 10 seconds. I get an extra 10. So I'll, what I'll say, you know, since I have an extra 10 seconds, I'll take a moment to first thank all of the charter commissioners who stepped up to do this work. Mm -hmm. um, I, I know the sacrifices that elected office requires, but I'd like to point out that the charter commissioners were not compensated for their work. Mm -hmm. So they were literally volunteers. At least I get a small stipend for the work that I do. Um, so again, a big, big thank you and shout out to all the commissioners for their work. Um, I, I really appreciate what Council Pelletier just said, what Tori just said about removing herself from the picture and, and, and thinking about what is the Portland that she wants to see and asking all Portlanders to look at it that way. Um, I, I agree with that sentiment strongly. I, however, with this uh, proposal, I'm worried that the mayor having so much of the policy making uh, responsibility could actually weaken the, the councilors' positions. 
Um, so for that reason, I'm a little bit uh, hesitant to support it. On top of that, I think that uh, the current system certainly has some uh, flaws, and it's not the most effective way to have constituents feel like the representatives are advancing policy that represents their concerns. However, on the school board side, which has the very same model, I experience a change in ideology and approach to the work simply when we change the people that were there, not the process. So we were able to get an executive director, superintendent, that was very well aligned with what the elected officials, the school board, had in mind for policy. And we were able to really shift direction significantly from what we were doing before mm -hmm. just by, by changing people. So as much as I believe that the current system is not perfect, I believe that if we had the right people in place, we could use systems of accountability to have a city manager that is very responsive to the elected officials. Um, I, I will not be voting in support of that um, proposal, but I do want to create a system in Portland where the elected officials do challenge the manager and do have a stronger voice in policy making and in the direction of the city. Um, and I also want to acknowledge that that was the, the very uh, basis of forming the, the Charter Commission itself. That was, like I think, the most fundamental reason that voters wanted to do it, because they found that their, their elected bodies were not really addressing the, the issues and concerns that they were raising. Um, I believe that the current system does allow those accountability measures to be used. It just has to be that we step up to do it, right? Like councilors have to have that political will to actually put themselves on the line and hold the, the executive manager accountable for their actions. I probably left a lot of time on the clock. 30 seconds. So wow. I'll, can I have a follow-up question? Please. The current city manager is an acting city manager because the, the former city manager departed and the council has held off on filling that position uh, permanently until the election. Am I understanding that correctly? There's a there's a search committee in place right now, and they've been working almost for a year now. And they've I believe they've already selected the hiring search that's going to be doing the that's going to be helping us identifying candidates. So that work has actually been ongoing. Uh -huh. The so the uh, city manager search committee has been working almost for a year now. Okay. So it hasn't really been paused. It's just been taking yeah. a while. Okay. Yeah. And I think too there there was some conversation about. Um, not knowing what the outcome will be. And so I think that might make things move a little bit slower. But yeah, I think that they're still going forward with the search regardless, so. Great. All right, we are on to question three, clean elections. Councillor Pelletier? Um, yeah, I mean, I don't even know that I'm gonna use all my time for this. I am in a full support of clean elections. I always have been. I certainly ran on as somebody with very limited income that just wanted to get involved and make a change. And when I think again about what do I want out of Portland, who do I want leading Portland, I certainly want individuals that aren't gonna be funneled in there with corporate money and corporate interests. And so I'm thinking about the counselors that I want. I want you know, a recent graduate for a counselor. I want service industry individuals for counselors. I want single parents for counselors. I want to make sure that the people that are serving Portland are really reflective of the disenfranchised community of Portland, the not privileged community of Portland, the working class of Portland, which really makes up the majority of our city. Mm -hmm. It's just unfortunate that for so often those with the loudest voices and the most privileged often get the most attention. So yeah, thinking about clean elections, it's really not um, a controversial topic for me. I think that it is, again, something that I will continue to support because I think about who do I want to make sure that I'm empowering and whose voice do I want to make sure I'm ampl amplifying? Um, and I am never, nor will I ever be in, in support of corporations getting involved in financially funding individuals' campaigns. I also really like the thought of a clean election fund, which is part of this too, mm -hmm. so that we can empower more people to run for office who don't have the means at all to really be spending the time on campaign materials and, um, and canvassing and all of the things that you need to do in order to really make yourself known. So yeah, I'm, I'm in full support of that and I'm hoping that that one passes and that we can really set a precedent in Portland that we are fully on board with clean, uh, clean elections and that we are taking a stand to say this is who we want representing us. These are people like us. These are working class individuals like us. Um, and we are not going to stand behind individuals that have corporate interests and are, again, being paid to, to run and, and run a campaign that is um, not authentic. So, Great. Seven seconds oh, to spare. <laughs> You're amazing. Roberto? Yeah, so this is probably the one question on the ballot that I'm most excited to support. Um, I think that uh, what this is a question that can fundamentally uh, change the, the you know the barriers to access to run for office, and um, and you know I'm I like to think a lot about what I experienced last year in my at-large race, 
where I raised less than $10,000, and that includes the money that I had to raise to pay for the legal fees of the recount, versus my opponent, I believe, outraised me, or they funded or fundraised close to like $50,000. Mm. Um, so I, there was not even, there was no way that I could compete with that. When you look at the list of donations, I didn't have anyone that maxed out. I didn't have anyone that gave me 500 bucks or anything major like that. All my donations were really small. So I, I couldn't compete, but yet I had been in service, in public service in the city for five years. You know, I had definitely shown that I had been dedicated to the work and public service, and I had given a good example of how I would carry myself in office. So that's, that's what carried me forward. I believe that candidates not having to worry about fundraising can really focus about running campaigns on issues, get to talk to their constituents, and get to like just really fundamentally engage with their community and voters and get them out to vote for the real reasons, not just get, you know, the most FaceTime on social media ads, or even TV ads, which right now we're seeing, you know, being exploited with the amount of money that's being dumped into these campaigns. So I think, again, clean elections is, uh, to me, uh, probably one of the most important things that's on the ballot, and I'm enthusiastically going to support it. Okay, great. Uh, we're going to have two minutes each for this next one. Uh, question four is on proportional ranked cho choice voting for Portland. Okay. Yeah, this one, um, again, I don't think I'm going to use a lot of my time. It, it, to me, it's more of a procedural change more than anything. And I think, um, you know, thinking about the Charter Commission race that was in 2020, I think that this is an amendment to, to possibly amend how that election turned out for a couple of individuals. I think currently for multi-seat races, the threshold you have to meet is 50%. I think that this would diminish it to 25%. And I think that that makes sense, especially given how few people are running for office. I don't think that we're having an influx of individuals that are running. I ran against one other person. Um, I think there are two people or one person in your at-large race. Like we're not having tons of people that are getting involved in public service. So I think it makes complete sense. I also think in the conversation around vote no on everything and enough is enough and the charter is too progressive and everything's too progressive. This to me, actually, if this the way that it is being proposed now existed when the Charter Commission was in place. The mm -hmm. Charter Commission slate would look very different. The Charter, the Charter Commission wouldn't be nearly as progressive as it is now if this proportional ranked choice voting was in place prior. So I'm, I'm putting that out to the people that are like, I'm too moderate for everything and I don't want to vote for anything. This actually, I think, will stop the chances of um, people being voted that aren't fully reflective of the electorate that elected them in based on this procedural change. So I am supporting it again. I think it's just going back to tweaking something um, that happened in 2020. And yeah, I, I don't really have a lot else to add about it. <laughs> okay, good job. Roberta? Um, yeah, same thing. I, I probably don't have very much else to, to add to it. I am supporting this. Okay. Um, you know, I, when you look at the cycle of elections, um, you often have two seats, for example, this year on the school board, you have two at-large seats that are open at the same time. You know, so you could potentially have a you know, pretty large slate of people that are running for it. And, and as I'm a strong proponent of ranked choice voting. And I think the more that we can do to tweak it to make sure that it has that intended purpose uh, or that intended outcome uh, of having it being a, a more democratic play, way for voters to elect their, uh, their officials, I think that we've experienced um, some hiccups, per se, when we saw what happened with the Charter Commission, and this addresses those concerns that were raised there. What I think is really neat about this proposal um, and then the press world, for once, give them credit, they did a really good job at representing this, is that the Charter Commissioners, that they themselves admitted they would not have won their races mm -hmm. if the system were in place, mm -hmm. they're supporting this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because again, they see it as a way to, to clean up what ranked choice voting is and to make it more democratic. So that, to me, is, is uh, the biggest endorsement that you can get. Someone that would have they would lost their own race, they're advocating for this change to be, place, uh, to be in place. So I'm strongly supporting it as well. Great, okay. Moving on, here's a big one, rent control. We've got two minutes each to discuss question C. So this is a, a citizen's initiative. And Victoria, go for it. Um, I'm in full support of rent control. I'm a renter. I, <laughs> at this rate, I might be a renter forever. And I think that the more that we can protect tenants, the better. There's a huge power dynamic between tenants and landlords. There always has been. There always will be. I think a huge um, component of this initiative is getting rid of the application fees, which is really huge. Because mm -hmm. when you're looking for a place, everybody's saying housing is a human right, but also you have to pay a $50 application fee. It's one of the most inequitable ways that we're moving forward in terms of trying to house people in apartments. Because on top of that, you also have to pay first month's rent, last month's rent, a security deposit. And all of this 
is on top of making sure that you are furnishing your own place to live. So I am in full support of that. I also really like the condo conversion fee. My building is being sold for $1.1 million. I have no idea what's going to happen. Maybe everyone will get evicted and it will turn into luxury condos. I really don't know, but that is such a common story that's happening in Portland for my friends and community members and neighbors as we are getting priced out by Airbnbs, which is also something that we'll, we'll talk about. But I want to ensure that I, as a tenant, am protected as far as I can be protected because it's getting really scary to be a renter in Portland. We really have very limited power. We have very limited rights. And as long as there is some sort of protection in place, we can at least feel like we're not going to be evicted for nothing. We can feel like you know we don't have to save up a ton of money if we want to look at multiple apartments and it's $50 for every apartment that we even want to look at, not even saying we want to rent it. Um, so I, I'm in full sh support of making sure that we can continue to protect renters. I think that this is a city of renters. This is a working class city, a city of service workers. And if we aren't moving forward with protecting people, we're not going to have anyone to be in Portland. We're not going to have the, the really rich, wonderful melting pot that Portland is. So as a renter and as somebody that is in community with a lot of renters, I'm fully in support um, of Question C. OK. Roberto? Yeah. So I am also in support of this question. Right now, I believe that renters are probably one of the least uh, advocated for uh, group of constituents that we have in this city. Um, I am incredibly worried about the reality that renters are, are experiencing in our city right now. Anecdotally speaking, I'm hearing about an increase of, uh, of, of people that are being evicted from, from their apartments. I know that the emergency rental assistant is sort of kind of like a, a just a band-aid on it on on the on the problems that we have right now. I would honestly, at this point, I think it's such an urgent issue. I would like us to start exploring uh, going back into a state of emergency so we can have an eviction moratorium in place. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm just beyond worried, particularly with a lot of the families, a lot of our. Um, really low socioeconomic families. You have multiple families that are staying in one apartment. So when one person gets evicted, you're evicting multiple families at once. And this is just a reality that, that we've seen. We've seen entire buildings, you know, dozens of families all at once lose their housing. That means their kids are displaced from schools. Mm -hmm. Often these are the kids that are depending on schools for their meals. So like, you know, the trickle down effect of these evictions is, is it reaches so, so far. So I'm, I'm with Victoria 100%. We need to do everything we can to protect renters in this city. And again, I feel like they're one of the least advocated for groups in, of constituents in our city. And I'm beyond worried uh, about what they're experiencing. I had a conversation with the city manager this morning, specifically talking, uh, trying to figure out what, we can, uh, what actions we can take as a council um, to protect them, including an eviction moratorium. Um, so I'm, again, just wildly concerned about the reality that renters are experiencing in our city. That's great. I have a friend that works at Preble Street, and she said, oh, you haven't seen anything yet because the uh, pandemic rent uh, support went away, mm -hmm. and then it took some months for the evictions to go through the system. Yep. And she said a lot of them are new Mainers, too, yep. that will mm -hmm. be losing their housing. So, mm -hmm. OK, we're going down to one minute each as we get down uh -oh. to these other okay. questions. Yeah, <laughs> Pete is on. Question D, the minimum wage. Victoria? <laughs> um, I support the minimum wage. I don't think this should be a shock to anybody. I, I feel like it's not a mic drop. I was very uh, you know, adamant on hazard pay in January and February, and we all saw you know, that conversation that happened. I believe that, um, I, I believe in the, the minimum wage and there's no like but for me and there's no like except for me. It's just I believe in the minimum wage period, especially in a city like Portland. Um, the minimum wage is not raising to $18 in January. It's gonna raise gradually. And I very much believe that our, the current wage that we have and the cost of living are not a community with one another at all. Portland is continuing to get more and more expensive. People are continuing to get priced out. And so with that, in a city like Portland, I, just, I certainly believe that we need to raise the wage. And I will be supporting question D. I know it's a very, very challenging one. It's a spicy topic for a lot of people. But I, again, want to pay and support workers the wage that they deserve, $18 an hour to me, which is not going to be in January. It's going to be gradual. But to me, that's not even a living wage. I also really, oh, no, I knew it was coming. I knew it was coming. I knew it. I was like, maybe I can say it. OK, I'm, gonna, I'm done. You got the quack. 
Yeah, so um, I'm, a, again, a strong, strong proponent of increasing the minimum wage. I actually, from what we've heard in committee work, I believe that we can support the $18 an hour right now because, it, so I believe that somewhere between 60 and 80 percent of the area total medial income um, is what we use to determine, and $18 an hour gets us within that range. Hmm. However, I'm not supporting this question because I feel like there is a huge, uh, rather, divide in eliminating the sub-minimum wage piece. I think that workers uh, have spoken pretty loudly around that. And what I would like us to do, and all of the citizens' initiatives actually, if they don't pass, I would like to commit the council to put those uh, issues on committee work and tackle them through our ordinance, through our cap capacity. And I believe that this is one that we all have the appetite to take on and have a, a, a collaborative and transparent conversation with the workers, with the, with the restaurant community, uh, to see how, how eliminating the sub-minimum wage really will impact us. I'm also worried that if this passes, we'll, we'll have five years where we won't be able to touch it. And if there are unintended consequences, I'd like us to be able to address them. Good job. Questions A and B we're putting together. They're both about Airbnbs or short-term rentals. Uh, Victoria, go ahead. You have a minute. Uh, okay. uh, so I will be supporting question B. I mean, I, I, I think, period, that we need to really get a handle of the, on the Airbnbs. Um, I'm supporting question B because I, I campaigned on, you know, I essentially campaigned on banning non-owner occupied Airbnbs. Um, and I want to make sure that we are pushing the restrictions as far as we can. Again, I'm getting concerned with the fact that individuals are getting priced out left and right. There are blocks and blocks of just non-owner occupied Airbnbs. We'll still have 250 of them. People will be need to, people will be notified within a 500 uh, I think it's 500 foot radius if they're living next to an Airbnb, uh, and I, I think that by doing this we can at least start to take the steps to really make sure that we're not continuing to price out individuals who are running these hotels blocks by blo block by block. It's I'm under no illusion that this is going to return an influx of housing. Stock. I know that we have a ton of work to do around affordable housing as well, but I am certainly concerned with the fact that Airbnbs have continued to go unregulated. <laughs> You're going to really that. hate ducks after this, are you, <laughs> Roberto? Yeah. Um, so I'm. I am actually. Uh, I'm super, super eager for us to to have a conversation about short-term rentals in the city, particularly the non-owner occupied. Uh, units. However, I'm not supporting this um, because of the impact that it will have on Peaks Island. I've heard from a, a lot of residents in Peaks Island and they're really worried about specifically how this is going to affect them. And they have a really unique set of circumstances in the island. I'm with Tori that I think uh, going into our ordinance for short-term rentals and I, I'm super, uh, I would be supportive of limiting uh, or further limiting the number of non-owner occupied units um, and anything else that, that we can look into that ordinance that we believe is going to help uh, mitigate some of the issues that we're seeing with the housing crisis. But again, because of the issues on Peaks Island and the uncertainty of how they're going to be impacted by this, I don't, I don't think I want to take the chance on getting stuck with a, a policy for five years that could affect them negatively. So you're no on A and B. Exactly. Yeah. Victoria, are you no on A and I'm B? I'm no on A, yes on B. And yes on B. Okay. Because A is grandfathering in the Airbnbs that exist. Right. Yeah. Gotcha. No on both. Yeah. All right. Question seven, police review by the people. I'm just looking at the time. Okay, one minute. So I, of course, am in full support of this. I think the current way that it's set up, individuals need to go to the police department with their complaints. I think that that is a huge um, issue in terms of, again, a power dynamic that's triggering for people, that's trauma for people. I like the fact that with this new setup, complaints can go directly to this new board, and then the board will send them to internal affairs. I think that makes sense. I think it removes the police presence from fielding these complaints. It's awkward to go to the police. It's not even awkward. It's kind of terrifying to think about going to the police department to make a complaint about the police department. So I'm really excited about um, this, the way that we're going to shift things. I also think that there are it will be positive to have more members with this. Currently, there are seven. Now there can be nine or more, um, and the council can yes. appoint some board members as well, which I think is great. So, yeah, I'm in. I'm in full support on this. This is a big yes for me, and I think that we can really take steps towards making sure that people are feeling safe in Portland, um, but also not having to do to give their complaint to the person that they're complaining about, and not understanding the dynamics that that creates for a lot of individuals. Thank you. Yeah, I'm also strongly supporting this as well. This is just going to improve the uh, assistance of accountability and transparency for the police department. Um, there's so much in this proposal to like. 
um, and there was so much, in, or there is so much in the current uh, Citizens Review uh, uh, panel that just really is ineffective. So I believe that this addresses so many of the issues and concerns that we've heard over the years about this process, and yeah, enthusiastically supporting it. Okay, great. Now we're going down to the real short time. We're going to give you 30 seconds to talk about question eight, which is code of ethics and an ethics commission. Uh, and Victoria? Yes. Um, so this is a yes for me. I, I, I like, we, we did adopt a code of ethics in the council, but I do like the fact that we're going to, ex this could potentially ex expand on it, um, you know, which I think is really helpful, especially as we're getting into the world of, of figuring out you know, ethics in, in the broader scheme of things. And, and I think with an ethics board and a commission, I think it will just make it easier for individuals to make sure that everything is by the book and there are no issues. I also really like the accountability officer that's part of this because I think, <laughs> <laughs> and that's it. <laughs> Good stuff. I love the quack. Um, yeah, I'm absolutely in uh, supporting this. Um, you know, codifying the the ethics commission uh, in the charter, I think it's just an, an important piece. Um, yeah, I, I think it's just another another system of accountability to make sure that we are doing public service the way that we all want to care, you know, hold ourselves accountable to. Yeah. Wonderful. All right, now we're going down to 15 seconds to talk about question six, Peaks Council. Uh, question six. <laughs> I'm getting like nervous. <laughs> Question six, Peaks, Peaks Island Council is a yes for me. They already exist. This is just, again, um, cementing it into the charter. So I think people were like, what's going on with the Peaks Island? They, they already exist. They have existed. This is just writing them into the charter. It's a yes for me. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Codifying a, a, a system that's already in place as an advisory body to the council. Uh, you know, again, we talked about Peace Island being a, an important group of constituents to the city. So, giving them uh, a codified way for them to have representation in council decisions is important. Wonderful. I messed up. I yes. accidentally skipped question five: school budget direct oh, yeah. vote. Go. Uh, so, I am in support of question five. Um, you know, the, the Board of Education, it's its own governing body. The city council is not the parent of, of the Board of Education. And I also think that um, individuals were worried about them writing a blank check. They're still accountable to the voters. There's still going to be a joint uh, school board, city council board that's going to happen during the budget season. I think it's going to be easier for voters to pay attention to one governing body rather than two, volleying it back and forth. And at the end of the day, at the end of everything, voters still have the ultimate decision as to whether or not they want to pass the budget. And I think individuals who are on the school board will be responsible with the budget if they want to continue to be elected again. So I don't see an issue with that. Yeah. Same thing, I'm a strong supporter of this one. I believe that the joint committee that will be formed between the council and the school board and the school board is going to create those systems of checks and balances that people are worried about losing. And I 100% trust the school board to put forward the budgets that are necessary for our schools to provide a high quality system of public education. Thanks, everyone. We ran out of time to talk about Question E cruise ships, but the longshoremen at, down at the docks and DSA negotiated a, a agreement to that one, so most people are going to skip that one, I think, on their ballots. I want to thank our tech crew tonight, Robert Kabeca, Jeffrey Cooper, David Bedell, of course, our director, Warren Edgar. We couldn't do this without you. Portland Media Center, thank you, audience, for being here. Get out and vote on Tuesday if you haven't voted already. Uh, we'll see you at the polls. Thank you.